welcome to the Warwick Christmas Lectures. Rulers and tape measures don't work in space, so how do we know how far away things are? Join Tish as she explains how physicists measure very, very large distances. Hello everyone, my name's Tish and I thought today we could talk about something that I'd say is a little bit underappreciated and overlooked, and that's the science of measurements. Now, the history of measuring things goes way back. We know that ancient Egyptians measured things in cubits, which is the distance from your elbow to your fingertips. And they used this scale to calculate how to construct the pyramids without them falling down. Now, we can fast forward to the ancient Greeks and you'll hear about scientists, or natural philosophers as they were called back then, who would dedicate their lives to the science of measuring things, all to better understand their place in the world. So the story goes, great thinkers like Ptolemy and Hipparchus figured out the shape and the size of the Earth using only a ruler like the ones you have at home. You see, what they did was measure the lengths of shadows in two different cities and using some math were able to take those measurements and figure out just how big the Earth is. This is because the Earth is curved and so different shadows in different places have different lengths. I find it mind-blowing that something as simple as taking out a ruler and measuring a shadow can tell us so much about the world we live in. So nowadays, technology has advanced way beyond rulers and cubits. We have computers that can do the maths for us, and we have machines that can do the measurements for us. We're pretty good at accurately measuring things that we can get hold of. Like, we can even fly an aeroplane all the way around the world and figure out the Earth's exact size down to the centimetre. We're good at that. But what about measuring things that we can't get hold of? For example, if I asked you, how heavy is the moon? How would we even go about figuring that out? How do we measure things that are so far beyond our reach? And this was the problem that struck German astronomer Frederick Bessel back in 1838, when he decided to measure the distance between us and a distant star, 61 Cygni. Well, Bessel used a clever trick that astrophysicists like to call parallax, and you can test it out at home right now. So to do this, I want you to stick your thumb out as far as you can in front of your eyes and close your left eye so that you're looking at it. And now, switch eyes and see what's happened to your thumb. If you switch between eyes back and forth like this, you'll see that your thumb seems to jump side to side. Now this side to side jumping is what is known as parallax. And the size of this jump depends on two things. Firstly, the spacing between your eyes. And secondly, the distance to the object that you're looking at, in this case, your thumb. So we can play with that second dependency a little bit. So let's move our thumbs a little bit closer to our faces. And this time when we open and shut our eyes, you'll see that our thumb jumps way, way more. What we're doing is actually taking two observations, two looks at an object from a distance apart, in this case, the spacing between our right and our left eyes, and seeing how much the object seems to jump around. And from the size of the jumping, we can figure out exactly how far away the object is. And by the way, this is how our brains figure out what the world looks like, and it does this all the time. It takes two slightly different images from each eye, compares them, combines them, and figures out exactly how far everything is. This is how we have what is known as depth perception. We can even demonstrate that right here, right now. I have two cameras on me at the moment, and even though I'm standing in exactly the same place, you can see the pictures are a little bit different, and that's how you can figure out where I'm standing in this room. Anyway, how can we use this idea to investigate the stars? Well, the idea is the exact same. We take two observations of the sky, separated by some distance, and compare them, and see how much the stars seem to jump around. Now, if you went into your back garden, tried this yourself tonight, look in your right eye and then look in your left eye, you'll see the stars don't seem to jump at all. Now, this is because the stars are just so, so far away. Remember how we said the jumping gets smaller the further our thumbs were from our faces? So, how do we make the jumps big enough for us to see? Instead of using our eyes, which are only separated by a few centimetres, like that much, let's separate our observations by the biggest possible distance we can. And this way, we can probably see the stars jump around. So, how do we find the biggest possible distance? Well, this is where scientists did something pretty clever. Let's get some props. This thing here, this is going to be the sun, and I'm going to need an Earth. Perfect. Obviously, the sizes of these are a little bit off, but the idea is the same. 
Here we have the Sun in the middle of our solar system, and here we have the Earth. And, as you might know, the Earth orbits around the Sun once a year, like this. Which means, in January, the Earth sits here on its right side. Six months later, after January, we have July, and now the Earth is on the left-hand side. So, what if we took a picture of our stars in January, waited six months until the Earth's gone all the way around, and we took the other observation? Then, the distance between the two observations would be massive, all the way from this side of our solar system right to the other side. And that was it! Using these two views of 61 Cygni, Bessel was finally able to see the jumping around of his star and calculate how far away it was. For the first time in history, we had found out exactly how far away we were from another star. Figuring out our place in the universe using science you can test at home. But of course parallax isn't the only method we use to study the cosmos. There are tons of others, including my favourite, called the Doppler effect, which has managed to unlock the secrets as to how our universe will one day die. And it all comes down to what colours we see in the night sky. So, as you might know, stars are actually all quite different from one another, and they shine in lots of different colours. You've got some stars that burn a bright bluish white, and some of them are orange, and some of them are even a deep red. Our sun is, in fact, kind of yellowish in the scale of stars. So, thanks to the works of some incredible astronomers, among them Henrietta Leavitt, Erna Hertzsprung, and Henry Norris Russell, we know that we can find out what colour the star should be if we just know how old the star is and how big it is. So now, I ask you to imagine the surprise astronomers felt when they looked up at the night sky in 1925 and found out that the faraway stars were shining with a lot more red than they were expecting. Like, a lot more red. Now, at this point, lots of scientists were thinking, maybe we've got our calculations wrong, maybe our telescopes are broken. But everything was double-checked, triple-checked, and no, it just looked like all of the stars were much redder than we originally thought. Why was this? Well, it turns out this was due to this phenomenon called the Doppler effect, which says that when a little bit of light, whether it's given out by a star, by a light bulb, by a torch, if this light is produced by something moving towards you, the light actually gets a little bit bluer. And similarly, if the light's moving away from you, it gets a little bit redder. Now, I know this sounds a bit weird, but the reason why we never see it happening with our eyes is because most things are moving just far too slowly for that extra little bit of red or blue light to show. It's just such a small amount that our pathetic little eyes just don't pick up on it. But what if it's something massive that's moving towards or away from you, and it's giving out a lot of light? Well, in this case, the colour of the object would change, and quite a lot. And this is what the telescopes were picking up on. So, all of these telescopes saw these distant stars all glowing red, which meant that the stars producing this light must be moving away from us on Earth. Now, this wouldn't be such a shocking thought if it was maybe one or two stars in the sky, but no, it was almost all of them. Almost all of the stars are hurtling away from us at monumental speeds. And this is how we found out how the universe is going to end. By looking at the colours of the stars, we realised that the universe is spreading out, and it doesn't look like it's going to stop anytime soon. In fact, we think that stars are going to continue to get further and further and further apart in the sky until the end of time itself. Now, of course space is absolutely massive, so on a day-to-day -day basis we don't notice this. But over years, over millions and billions and trillions of years, if humanity is still around, we're going to see our stars getting slowly darker and darker as everything moves out further away into the empty space of the universe. Now, again, this won't happen for a very long time, so nothing for us to worry about. But I think it's pretty astounding that we've probably figured out what will happen in the unbelievably distant future just from gazing up at the stars and taking some measurements. In many ways, we're not all that different from the Greek philosophers 2,000 years ago who used the shadows to calculate the size and shape of the Earth. We're all just curious minds using the tools we have at our feet to understand our place in the cosmos. Merry Christmas to all of you and have a good new year.